Hi, welcome back to SEO on Air. I'm your host, Aaron Basil, and today we talk to Joe Stoffel, Director of SEO at Marcel Digital. We talk about forecasting and SEO, website migrations, and how to integrate SEO with other departments. I hope you enjoy this episode. But now that you mention it, what is the funny story of uh, you getting into SEO? So my, my start in SEO, it's, it's one of those things where like, I didn't pick SEO, SEO picked me. Um, it started when I graduated from college back in 2009, 2010, and I did what all the cool kids do, uh, move back in with their parents because I didn't have a job. And so I was out in Raleigh, North Carolina at this point, you know, just looking for job opportunities, just trying to get out of my parents' house. They're amazing. I love them to death, but I don't want to live with them in a post-college world too extensively. Um, so this had me looking for marketing sort of opportunities, marketing internships, just to get my foot in the door, because that was my background. I went to uh, college for marketing and advertising, essentially. And so there's a company promoting a digital marketing internship uh, that I went and I you know, showed up for and applied to, essentially. And, you know, when I got there, it was just a bunch of like cool people just hanging out, like wearing like pajamas and wearing sandals. And we're just kind of like shooting the shit. Apologies. I should not be swearing, but you know, hopefully there's no children listening. Um, but, you know, just a lot of like cool people, friendly people. And they're like, yeah. And on, on Friday afternoons at 2.30, we play the drinking game, asshole. And I was like, sold. You got me. I don't care what you're going to pay me or what I'm going to be doing. And that is how I started my SEO career. Um, so they brought me on with this internship. And it was essentially, I learned how to not do SEO. It was massive outreach to like mom bloggers, asking them to essentially put links to our clients' websites. So I had like mom bloggers writing about B2B businesses and things that just from today's like relevancy perspective, it ain't going to fly. Or submitting massive amounts of directory links, like the directory maximizers of the world, the best of the webs, the Yahoo directory. I, you know, I can still see these directories in my sleep, Aaron. Like it's like, JoeAnt.com. I bet you that thing costs $39.99 and I haven't looked at it in 12 years or so. So that's how I started. But as I started getting more involved in the company, taking on more of an account manager role, you know, I wanted to learn. I didn't want to just sit there and build directory links all day and send, you know, 100 outreach emails. So I started reading the Mozes, the search engine lands, the SEO roundtables, watching Rand on the whiteboard Fridays was a huge part of me growing into the SEO that I am today. And I quickly came to the realization that Hey, we're, we're doing a lot of things that we probably shouldn't be doing. And we're missing a lot of opportunities from like a technical standpoint and optimizing the pages that they already have. And that's how I slowly, not slowly, how I came to learn Screaming Frog. And I will say that learning Screaming Frog helped me immensely become the technical SEO that I am today because there's so many different things that I can detect. And when you see something you don't understand, you go to that user guide, you read about it, you figure out what it is, what the best practice is, why it's important. That was incredibly, incredibly important. So I stuck with that agency for a while and eventually, you know, had an opportunity to come on and head up the SEO department at Marcel Digital as I am doing today and eventually made that transition. And we're, we're going on about seven years at this point. But yes, I didn't know what SEO was when I started. The acronym meant nothing to me. I, I think it was a fairly, you know, it wasn't really talked about. It was fairly new. Definitely wasn't being offered in college at that point. So kind of fell into it, but it worked out because, you know, what really kept me in this space is that problem solving, problem solving mentality, you know, the cause and effect of it. You know, I just kind of fell in love with it as I really got into it and got outside of the directory link building aspect of what we'll call SEO. So maybe one bonus question I can ask is that was your, let's say, history and journey into SEO. Where do you see yourself moving from here in the next, let's say, five years time? So, you know, what I hope to do is, is continue growing this department at Marcel Digital. You know, since I've started, we've, we've grown pretty significantly. We've doubled the size of the company. It went from a department of one and now it's a department of five. And, you know, I want to keep growing this. I want to keep improving our processes. I want to keep finding ways to improve our service offerings with all the new off with all the new technologies coming out. Ever heard of this thing, ChatGPT? I have not stopped hearing about it for about a month and a half, but using stuff like that to, you know, increase the efficiencies of the optimizations and the research that we're doing, you know, adjusting and pivoting with, you know, Bing and, you know, Google now adopting BARD and all that, you know, better fueling the future as search is going to continue becoming more conversational and figuring out how do we tackle that from a content perspective. 
I want to be driving forward more initiatives around video and, and, and custom imagery and infographics because you know what I'm seeing today is Google is regularly rewarding uh, articles and resources that have these sort of video engagement points and these sort of infographics. Not everyone wants to come in and read a long article. They want to consume different types of content. And if that's not on your radar, you're going to fall behind pretty quick. Because I think we've already seen a significant uprise in it. And I don't think it's going anywhere. We did figure out that forecasting SEO was something that you are very much into. So could you give us a first a little brief about what exactly is that and how you approach it? Sure. And so, you know, forecasting and SEO, this is historically one area that I've shied away from. And I think a lot of people in SEO have shied away from it. So when we're forecasting for SEO, we are trying to give our clients, because, you know, we work so much on the agency side, we are trying to give our clients an idea of what they can expect. We're trying to give them something quantifiable that they can go to their CFOs or their managers and give them an idea of what they can get from this SEO campaign. You know, it's hard. It's, it's hard to predict what you're going to get from SEO. It's hard to calculate ROI. You know, I'm convinced these days that anyone that's calculating ROI is doing SEO a disservice because yes, you can quantify leads and you can quantify revenue, but there are so many different things that it does for your brand that you can't measure. You know, for example, creating content that aligns with your common user questions, how much, how much pressure is that taking off your, your call center for handling client or prospect type requests? So, you know, we've identified the need for quantifying what we can in SEO. And so going into an SEO campaign with a client and giving them an idea of what they can expect has been incredibly valuable for us. It has helped us get buy-in in terms of the optimizations and the content initiatives that we want to push forward, you know, engaging with their PR teams for backlinks. So, you know, when we're able to go ahead and show them that, hey, after three to six months of the engagement, this is the sort of lift we're going to see. And if you stick with us for two years and we are hitting our deadlines, here's where you're going to be after, you know, a, a, a significant period of time. So for us, we are trying to forecast what traffic you're going to get. And then knowing the client has specific KPIs that they want to be measuring towards forecasting what our traffic is going to do in relation to those KPIs. How many more leads are, can they expect to drive? How much more revenue are they going to get from this traffic increase? And so at its core, that's what we are trying to solve from an SEO forecasting standpoint. So, so the KPIs that you are mentioning itself, are these, what are the, some of the common ones that you can maybe talk about? Sure. And so, you know, part of it is traffic. We do use this as a baseline. I think if you're not using traffic and forecasting, I mean, I think it's going to be very difficult to do. But at the end of the day, we know what our clients' goals are. And so part of you know having our in-house analytics team is we can make sure that any sort of conversion point, touch point is being tracked in analytics. So, hey, form fills might be an example, a basic example that a lot of people can have set up from their website. But we'll also use things like, hey, qualified leads from Salesforce if the client's going to give us that sort of data. But essentially, you know, revenue or something that like directly ties to quality leads uh, if we're working with B2B clients. Okay. Um, I was going to ask a curveball question, but I'll maybe save it for the next part. Okay. But in terms of SEO forecasting and the experience that you have in it, um, how often would you say, let's say you were wrong or a bit inaccurate about your forecast? I'm 100% accurate all the time. Uh, just kidding. That would not be realistic. And I, I'll, you know, there's, there's plenty of forecasts that are wrong. Um, where they are off by, you know, whatever it might be. Um, it does fa happen fairly often, but a lot of it, I believe, is because we're not getting the initiatives done that we want to on the SEO side of things. Uh, when we're creating these forecasts, we do want to give an aggressive yet realistic idea of what we can drive. But on the SEO side of things, especially in the agency world, we know that we get roadblocked quite a bit. You know, working with these clients, there are organizational um, you know, structures that we have to get incorporated with, with their development teams at times, with their content teams at times. So the less of those, you know, content initiatives or optimizations or technical fixes that we're getting implemented in a timely manner, the more it's going to throw off that forecasting. Um, you know, in my earlier days, I had an approach where I would attempt to forecast by picking all the keywords you want to rank for, taking their search volume, estimating the ranking that you're going to get and the click through rates. And I found that to be wildly inaccurate. Um, so, you know, in addition to that, I would say the implementation is where we see the most disconnect from our, from the accuracy in our forecast and the actual numbers that you're going to get. So you had mentioned it was around six months that you had given your clients to, um, 
predict that much time of what, how things could be in that much time. Um, but sorry, if it says no, not at all, not at all. And so you know, six months is generally when we can tell them confidently that hey, if we're getting all of our stuff done, we expect to see a pretty notable lift. And a lot of that is tied to our net new content initiatives. You know, when we're when we're bringing on an account, you know, we're doing an SEO audit and we're going to get an idea of, OK, out of all the issues or opportunities we're finding, we're going to be able to kind of expect this sort of lift or sort of quick win optimization opportunities. But when we're talking about the net new content where we're closing keyword gaps and really driving more volumes of traffic, we do know that it takes time for those resources to build up. You know, you publish a brand new page, it's not going to rank overnight. And so that kind of three to six month time frame, you know, with some good links to these resources, we have found is, is a very achievable time frame for driving uh, significant traffic increases from net new content pieces. Right. So what I was going to ask is what exactly is the approach step by step in that six month time? I think you've kind of um, explained here and there what exactly happens, but could you maybe give us like a timeline of from the start to end of what exactly will go on? Sure. So, you know, I think there's a couple of ways that we can think about this and talk about this. So, you know, what you're talking about is kind of for us, like how we're executing on the SEO side. Uh, this forecasting we are doing at the beginning of the project typically, and we can see as time goes on, how are we aligning with those kind of forecast goals? So, you know, from the forecasting perspective, just a, you know, a quick overview or quick-ish overview of our methodology, um, you know, we are relying heavily on historical data to create these sort of forecasts. Uh, so taking historic, historical data from the previous years um, and applying that to where we think we can be. So essentially we outline, OK, what was our organic traffic last year? And from there, we essentially apply a multiplier for each month uh, based on what we think is naturally going to happen. So this consider things like historical trends where if the client had been losing SEO performance over the last three years as a decline to come in and expect that, hey, they're going to see a 15% increase without changing anything, that's wildly inaccurate. So I think it's important to be mindful of historical trends for performance because maybe they are having SEO issues that are holding them back. Maybe the competition is getting really aggressive and kind of beating them out. So I think you know it's really important to have that historical context for that multiplier aspect but we also need to incorporate milestones of the SEO project. So maybe after month three, we say, hey, we expect all of our SEO audit implementations to be in place. And we're expecting this sort of lift because of that. So in month three, as we're kind of projecting out the SEO forecast, we can say, hey, you know what? We think we're going to see a 10% increase after implementing all these SEO initiatives from the audit. And so for that third month of the campaign that we're forecasting, we'll say we're going to see a 10% lift over what we had last year. Um, same thing can be said for like an SEO migration. You know, if there's a significant change to URLs, we're anticipating a 15 to 20 percent drop in month six of the SEO campaign. And so you can kind of account for that as you're forecasting those numbers out. And so that's really where we start. It's kind of looking at the historical data and applying a multiplier to it for each month. And then we start getting into, OK, well, how much additional traffic are we estimating we're going to drive to the website? from net new content initiatives and ongoing optimizations. And so with this sort of approach, we are again, looking at existing traffic and kind of looking at some of the top traffic resources, articles, blogs, because when we're creating content for our clients, we tend to be among the higher traffic drivers for them, you know, with white papers and articles and whatnot. And so essentially what we do is we say, okay, well, based on the budget, we are gonna be tackling this many optimizations and this many net new content initiatives a month. And so based on that, we say at their peak, when they're performing at their best, we think that this grouping of content optimizations is going to drive this much organic traffic or this much additional organic traffic. And so with that, we do like to apply a time lag where for the first month, you know, of this, all this potential traffic we think we're going to get when they hit their peak potential in the first month, we know we're only going to get like five to 10 percent. You know, month three, we're going to get maybe 25 to 50 percent of that. But by month, but by month six, we do expect we're going to 100 percent of that. So we're able to kind of stage out each month of our optimizations and content to a specific month. And so we take those numbers, add them up for the year and add them to our multiplier to get an idea of how much total traffic do we think we're going to get from kind of your historical trends, the initial audit items, and all these net new content pieces that we're going to be adding to your website or these optimizations that we're going to be applying to your website as the year goes on. Right. 
I, I was going to ask that, let's say in the fourth month of your process, you do come across an inaccuracy in the forecast. You can pretty much go back to your drawing board, change it, change the algorithm, I guess, a little bit here and there, and then come back with new content to make sure that you kind of hit the mark again, right? You can, you can, you know, these are, these are all ways with this multiplier, you can go ahead and adjust it. You can start adding in actuals to your forecast to see how far off are you and kind of pivot, re, re update your forecast there. It absolutely can be done. Um, but again, you know, those are instances where I am trying to use that sort of information for that client buy-in to get these things done, because that's typically where we are seeing those forecasts starting to be off uh, substantially. You did mention website migration, which is kind of moving things a bit forward. What exactly are the different types and the issues that you have come across when migrating different websites? Sure, absolutely. And so website migration, there's there's a bunch of little nuances to this. You know, for us, it's essentially when there's going to be significant changes to your website's URL structure or to your website's content that are going to kind of put rankings in jeopardy. Um, and so when people are talking about some of the more common types of website migrations you deal with, you know, you have kind of like your, hey, maybe you want to migrate from HTTP to HTTPS, which hopefully you've done already. But if you haven't, you know, that protocol type migration so that you're pushing everything to the secure version of a page, you know, that's one example of a migration that we've worked with in the past. You know, perhaps you're, you're migrating subdomains. Um, maybe you had initially set up your blog at blog example.com and you want to move it off the root domain as its own subfolder because you think there's added benefits. Um, you know, that's another example of sort of a, a migration that you might see. Um, another common one is like a domain name migration. You know, you're, you're picking up a different website domain. So you're going from olddomain.com to newdomain.com. So going through, making sure that all those URLs are forwarding on, making sure that you're communicating that sort of change to Google through Google Search Console. You know, that is another one that we typically go through and one that actually we just wrapped up a project for a client on. Um, another one that we often go through is like with merging websites. So think of like a, a merger and acquisition where, you know, the company maybe bought a different company and they get to absorb that content, get to absorb that website authority, which I love these because these are just opportunities for growth, right? You're, you're looking at the website that they've acquired. You're finding what content resources are performing well. You're adding it to your client's website and you're communicating that authority change with redirects. And then there's also, you know, like reskinning publishing website where maybe URLs aren't changing, but you're redesigning where in these instances, I'd be like wanting to look at, are we following SEO best practices with all these changes in design? Are we in adding CSS or JavaScript elements that maybe are going to negatively impact your core web vitals metrics, your page experience metrics versus what you had on the previous website? Um, you know, there could be like replatforming, uh, moving from one CMS to the next. So these are the sort of little nuance sort of website migrations that we find ourselves dealing with on a, on a you know, fairly regular basis. And with all of those, how are you able to migrate the site then without any, let's say, traffic loss or other issues, you know, affecting the main website itself? Sure. No, you just, you, you, you hope for the best. Um, <laughs> just kidding. It takes a very rigorous, uh, very rigorous process. So over here at Marcel, we have a very vetted out process that constantly is being tested and once in a while we'll tweak, but we've found it to be very successful. Um, that said, when we are looking at our approach for maintaining SEO visibility, when a website is say, changing a bunch of URLs, you know, it's a tumultuous time. That's, that's scary because you are putting your non-branded rankings in jeopardy. So for us, we always start with benchmarking. You want to benchmark traffic and you want to benchmark your rankings so you can look at the end of the project to determine, you know, how did this go? Did we achieve what we wanted to achieve? Were we able to maintain that traffic, those rankings that, you know, we've worked so hard to get? And so for us, you know, we start with the benchmarking, but then we go into what we refer to as a content analysis. And for this, we are compiling every single URL we can possibly find for this website in order to look at them individually and see what is driving SEO performance, what is driving SEO success. So here at Marcel Digital, our content analysis, we're looking at all the pages receiving organic traffic over an extended period of time. We are looking at the pages generating conversions. We are looking at the pages that are getting inbound links. We are looking at the pages that are getting, you know, top 20 keyword rankings in SEMrush. And then we are combining that with list of, okay, all the URLs in your XML sitemap, everything we identify in a screaming frog site crawl, everything that Google has indexed, um, you know, 
essentially we are producing this massive list of URLs that we do du duplicate down. And so knowing that we're incorporating metrics like traffic and links and number of rankings per page, which we actually do is create this analysis that scores every URL on your website in this you know, weighted SEO score. It's a formula that produces this weighted score. And from that weighted score, we determine whether you're a five, four, three, two, or one, essentially five being like, this is a very high value page for SEO. It gets a lot of traffic, it drives conversions, you get a bunch of links. And then like the SEO ones are like, you know, older resources that haven't been visited where you still should account for from a redirect perspective, but maybe you don't need to be as critical in terms of making sure that content's transferred over. And we found this content analysis to be a very critical and effective step in our, in our process because it serves two functions. One, you can go to the client and be like, here's a list of all your pages that are performing well for an SEO perspective. So as they're going through and determining what content should we get rid of, what content should be refreshed, what content should stay, they have this guide that shows them, hey, these are driving links and traffic and conversions, don't get rid of this page. At the same time, my team will use this kind of content analysis as like a priority list for redirect mapping. You know, if you're working on a large website where there's 10,000 redirects to map out and you're kind of getting, you know, pinched in terms of crunch time because a, a launch is looming and you know, you're not getting the time that you necessarily need or just the sheer high volume, you need to prioritize those redirects accordingly because not every redirect should be treated equally. And so we're looking at those fives, fours and threes and making sure that we are kind of anally redirect mapping these out. We want to make sure that they are as one to one as humanly possible. And so that content analysis helps fuel again what the content or the client should be carrying over and where we should be focusing most of our efforts in terms of the redirect mapping strategy. Um, I think another important part of this is also, you know, being that on Marcel Digital, we're an integrated agency, I can go to the paid search team and just say, hey, what URLs are you driving traffic to, to make sure that those are accounted for? And at the same time, once we've mapped out all of our redirect destinations, I can go to the paid search team and say, hey, update all your campaigns to use this landing page, uh, as opposed to what you had been using previously. Um, so that's kind of like the earlier stages. Now, the redirect mapping is incredibly important for preserving this migration, but if you're setting up a new website that doesn't follow SEO best practices, that isn't optimized, that isn't mobile friendly, that is a, a serious lag in terms of performance, you know, you're going to be redirecting to a website that might not carry the same value, the same SEO effectiveness that the previous one did. So it's very important that while we're doing all this redirect prep, we are consulting on the new website you know, consulting on the information architecture, making sure that those SEO best practices are being met, whether it be metadata, structuring header tags, internal linking, canonicals, hreflang, all that good stuff. Um, and also, you know, helping our content loaders load that more effectively. Just go ahead and run a crawl of the old website, give them all the meta descriptions, all the page titles to make sure that we are loading optimized metadata into the new website. Um, give them an indication of the sort of schema structure data that's in place and where so that they go ahead and add it to the new website. So it's really two parts is accounting for those redirects and making sure that that website that you're redirecting to is going to be ready to drive, you know, the most optimal SEO success. Um, and so, you know, from there, we have kind of a website that we trust that's fairly built out. We have all these different URLs that we know need to be addressed from a redirect perspective. And then we get into the one to one redirect map. And so, you know, hopefully automating that as much as possible, you know, to speed up that process, we like to use Screaming Frogs extraction tool using like VLOOKUPs in Excel to kind of match URLs based on common criteria. You know, for example, you're working with an e-commerce website that has 80,000 product pages. If you can scrape the product SKU and the associated URL, use a VLOOKUP, you can knock out large volumes of those redirects at once in a very efficient manner. But that one to one redirect mapping aspect of this process, while very tedious, is incredibly important. And so after you've mapped all that out, you're not done yet, um, because to continue ensuring, we want to make sure that we're pre launch testing. So running a pre launch crawl of the website when it's pretty much buttoned up and about ready for launch to again, make sure that we are optimized for those core web vitals to make sure that we have effective internal linking where those are all updated, so not going to alter redirect mobile friendliness, again, all the common culprits that you would essentially review in an SEO audit, in addition to QAing redirects. So we like to work with our development team to set up, you know, like a local website where we can actually test that these redirects go to the destinations that they're intended. 
And once we feel good with that pre-launch testing, we are essentially doing the exact same thing in a post-launch cadence where, yes, we are crawling the website again to make sure that we're not blocking when a robot's text or that meta robots tag isn't still in place, making sure that the XML sitemap did publish, making sure that we aren't linking to the staging website, you know, making sure that you're communicating these site changes to Google and Bing, submitting XML sitemaps. You got to be testing those redirects on production to make sure that they're firing as 301s, making sure that they're going to the accurate destination. This is all, again, there's a lot to this. It takes a lot of time, but these are all the little areas that you need to be investing the time in to make sure that this is being done correctly. And after all that, you're still not done, in my opinion, um, because what you should be doing after a site launch is regularly monitoring that 404 traffic. So whether that's figuring out what the page title is when you break a page on your website, looking at analytics to see, okay, is traffic coming in on broken pages, 404 pages that we need to retroactively add redirects for? You know, we have a very comprehensive process to account for all the redirects early on, but once in a while something goes live as you're, you know, Possibly, you know, there wasn't a content freeze, so something might go live after the analysis is done, or maybe there is something that just got lost in the shuffle. So this is one way that we can cover our bases to make sure that that traffic is hitting live pages that we want them to, and that we're not having to add redirects retroactively. And then when it's all said and done, a month and a half after, and hopefully everything is kind of sorted out, you go back to your benchmarks. You know, you review your initial organic traffic and those rankings that you wanted to preserve and you compare to where you are in a post-launch cadence. Um, you know, do you have the traffic back to where it was? Do you have those rankings back to where they were? And if not, reassessing why did that happen? Did we remove that content? Did we tweak the pages? Did we remove a bunch of internal links to the old ranking resources? And so I know there's a lot in there. And I think there's a, a blog post, I think, I know there's a blog post on marceldigital.com that covers all this and more and probably things I'm forgetting, but this is essentially the, the process that we follow to make sure that we are migrating websites as effectively as possible from an SEO perspective. All right. I, I was going to actually kind of interrupt you in between, but you were going to the next stage of it, which is completely Sorry. fine because now I just have to remember all the stages <laughs> together. <laughs> but um, if I have it all correct, we start with benchmarking and then we continue with the con content analysis. Yep. And then we do a bit of um, redirect research, I believe, right? Um, redirect, redirect mapping, yes. Right. Uh, yeah, sorry, ma site mapping. And, um, and then we can do the uh, redirects as well. We do a bit of the SEO audits along with the pre-launch testing. Yep. And then we can maybe move one other step forward to also take care of any 404 issues. Yes. Yeah, so, you know, in that pre-launch testing, hopefully you're catching broken links on the website. But yes, in a post-launch world, again, still doing that post-launch crawl to see if there's anything broken linked, um, but also in analytics, just to make sure that redirects weren't missed and people are coming to the website on a 404 page, essentially. So maybe they're clicking on your organic result. Maybe, shame on you, SEO team, you missed that redirect. And now people are being driven to your website through a 404 page. So then you can take that URL that you missed and, and add it to all the other redirects that you had done earlier. Okay. And then once you're completely happy with what you have, you go back to the cycle and um, do benchmarking again. Um, I, I like to evaluate across, uh, against the original benchmarks. And if you're back to where you were, you have those rankings, you have your organic traffic back to where it was. I call that a successful migration. And now it's focused on, all right, how can we drive additional organic growth now that we were able to survive that SEO migration time period? All right. Um, so that whole entire process, however, from benchmarking to the throughout back to benchmarking, um, how long would you say it takes? And what are some, let's say, common mistakes some, let's say, website owners go through? Oh, wow. Or some mistakes um, maybe you have gone through yourself? I've had many learning experiences, uh, humbling ones earlier on. Um, you know, the time frame can vary because a lot of the times you're working with a web launch timeline, right? And the unfortunate reality is a lot of times, you know, earlier on in the campaign, SEO gets all this importance, but as timelines are getting tight and you have feature pushes kind of pushing out the launch date, and then you have the higher ups of these clients coming in and saying, when is this going to launch? The reality is that timeline often shrinks for SEOs. So, you know, making sure that your voice is being heard, I think is, is a critical portion of this, but I'm, I'm getting sidetracked. So, you know, if you're talking about some of the common mistakes that are made in website migrations, there's, there's a lot of different things that can go wrong. And so 
there's a lot of common ones and there's a lot of ones that I would just recommend that people look out for. And so at the very top, I think the big ones that we want to speak to is just not involving the SEO team at all. I can't tell you how many times this happens where we have people that come to us after they've launched a new website and their rankings have just tanked, they've lost a bunch of organic traffic and it's because the SEO team or there, you know, there was no SEO considerations. So I think that's a, a major kind of mistake that a lot of people still make today. Um, you know, kind of in a similar vein to that, not implementing redirects for all your URL changes. You know, those non-branded rankings are the hardest to achieve, but they are the easiest to lose. And if you're not redirecting from the old ranking content to the new ranking content location, you're going to lose a lot of that visibility. Um, another one that I commonly see with website migrations is leaving that block in place. So, you know, when you're building out a website and staging, you want to block, you know, meta robots, no index tag um, is my recommended approach, or you can go ahead and protect it behind a login. But when you're launching the website, just making sure that you're not blocking search engines again in that meta robots, no index tag, the robots text, anything like that, will that will actually prevent Google and you know, search engines in general from accessing your content and seeing your website. Um, another big one is just not going through that content analysis portion of the process, you know, removing or deleting content that performs well for SEO because you didn't realize it. You didn't take the time to see how much, you know, how much value is this resource driving? You remove a couple articles, you see significant traffic drops, you have people yelling at you, why did we lose X, Y, and Z rankings? And a lot of the times it's just because that diligence isn't being done in terms of assessing what is performing well from a content perspective. Now, if we're getting into a lot more little nuanced ones, I do have a good number of lists. And again, there's probably more that I'm forgetting here, but one at a basic level is not implementing SEO friendly redirects. You know, for an SEO migration, let's not get cute. I'm like just 301 redirects all day long. Let's just stick with that. That's the best practice. You know, some people might be like, well, if you leave a 302 temporary redirect up for long enough, Google will eventually treat it as a permanent redirect. I'm like, don't, let's not go that route. Let's just follow the best practice, use 301 redirects. Don't shoot yourselves in the foot. Um, another one is where I see a lot of people mass redirecting to the home page and not going through that one-to-one -one redirect mapping process. So again, if your old ranking resource gets redirected to the home page instead of the actual content location it's going to live at, you're going to lose a lot of that ranking that that previous ranking resource had established. Um, another one I think is just not unifying your URL structure in terms of like secure versus non-secure and www. So, you know, we like to make sure that all of our, our client uh, URLs are 301 redirected to a single canonical variation. So HTTPS www and also need to account for trailing slash or non because actually Google will look at that as different URLs as well. So that's another important part of the process in terms of consolidating all that equity as you're going through this migration process. I think a lot of people also overlook, you know, accounting for image URLs and PDFs. You can see how these are performing. Go into Google Search Console and see how much traffic you're getting from Google image search results and seeing what resource and what images are associated with that and accounting for those as well. Or looking at the PDFs that you have in Google Search Console, you know, assuming that you can't see this data in Google Analytics and accounting for that in redirect mapping or in your redirect mapping, or potentially taking that PDF and building it out as its own HTML static page to better engage your users. I think those are often overlooked. Um, legacy redirects. What are some of the important redirects that you've put in place you know, in previous years? And if you're moving to a new platform, are you going to lose those? You should account for those because some of those might still have a lot of value, a lot of historical link equity. Um, another one that I, run into more often than not, and I'm surprised that more people don't talk about it, is not accounting for query strings. So there's been several instances where I've worked with clients where they were implementing redirects and we have all the mapping done, we've done all this work, but once you introduce any sort of query string, any sort of parameter, it actually breaks the redirect for whatever reason. So you need to be working with your development teams to make sure that you're able to pass that query string through the redirect, you know, in cases of like a UTM tag. Because if people are clicking on an old LinkedIn post where it's, you know, tagged, uh, you know, with specific UTM, so you can see that campaign and analytics, that redirect will in fact break if you're not accounting for this. Or think of it from a paid search perspective. While I believe you should be working with the paid search teams to make sure that their destination URLs are updated, 
sometimes are missed. And if you have that GCLID that's added to the end of your URL as part of a Google, you know, pay-per-click campaign, that could potentially break your redirect and you might see a bunch of traffic hitting 404, you know, 404 pages that you're essentially paying for that traffic. And so I think this is one that more people need to be accounting for because it can be, you know, have serious impact on how your redirects function and referral traffic and paid search traffic. Um, you got more? Because I got a few more uh, top of mind, but uh, I don't want to overwhelm you at this point. No, it's fine. It's fine. If you do have a bit more, we can carry on with it. But one thing I did want to maybe just slide in there is throughout all this website migration, there is a lot of technical issues that you have to clean up and go through and make sure they are in order. So are there any other tools like Streaming Frog that you mentioned that you also use to help you with website migration? It's a great question. Um, I will say that a combination of Screaming Frog and Excel are probably the most frequently used for me. Now, like, you know, if I want to go ahead and I want to see from a from a core of vitals page experience standpoint, you can fire up Lighthouse, run it in your browser, you know, Google's uh, dev tools to see how that's performing. I think that's a big one. Obviously, using analytics and search council for benchmarking, Google Analytics for kind of submitting the domain name change if you're changing domain names. But a lot of what I'm doing in kind of this technical portion, this technical analysis is with Screaming Frog because I can run that thing on demand. And if you're, you know, blocking with like a Meta Robots No Index or something, you can essentially tell Screaming Frog to ignore it and crawl it as if it's not there. Where, you know, if you try to run it with maybe like a SEMrush site crawl, I, I do think there are actually, you know, areas in there where you can bypass that sort of thing. But I will say Screaming Frog has been my favorite, most effective tool when doing this sort of technical analysis. Because, I mean, like while hearing all of it, I was like just wondering, are there any other tools that are helping you out with this? Or is this all just one tool that's and just some good brain power? It's I mean, it's not just one tool. I, you know, if we were to walk through the process right now, I'd probably start pulling up tools that I'm not even thinking of right now. But I will say uh, Excel and Screaming Frog are key. <laughs> You know, simple tool, well, streaming frog, I wouldn't say simple, but are, are incredibly effective tools. And if you need to get through an entire migration with just Excel and um, Screaming Frog and hopefully the appropriate historical data, um, you know, awesome. it is something you can use. But again, link tools, keyword tools to see what is ranking, what's driving links, those should also be included in this process. I guess I overlooked those in my initial answer. All right, all right. Um, are there any more nuances you want to add? Because we can, by all means. Nice. Only if you can hang in there with me, but um, a couple more. Gotcha. Uh, one, one I would say is when you are changing domain names, um, not going in and communicating that to Google. You can go ahead and submit that domain name change um, request. I don't know if request is the right term, but so Google understands that, hey, it's not olddomain.com, it's now newdomain.com. Um, I think not monitoring 404 traffic after a migration is a mistake that a lot of people make. They might have a bunch of people hitting dead pages and they don't even know it. Um, you know, some of the simple things like not publishing an XML sitemap or submitting that to Google and Bing after the site launch so they understand your new URL structure. I think that's a, you know, a kind of a 101, but still oftentimes missed in terms of these website migrations and general site launches. Um, you know, one of the things is launching during a Google update, which, you know, I know we don't often get heads up that, hey, the, the, uh, next, um, you know, quality update is coming or the, you know, they play a trailer for the next uh, update. Exactly. Exactly. Now, if you know, something's coming like, Hey, the page experience updates launching on this date, maybe you try to work around that. But so many times, you know, Google's just like core algorithm update came out. That's the one I was trying to think go. of a minute ago. You're not going to be able to account for that. But if you know a major update's coming up, try to step around that because otherwise you're going to be like, did I lose rankings as a result of that update? Was the migration? And it's going to be harder to diagnose if things do go wrong. Um, I'm sorry, the last couple of ones, just, just kind of the common pitfalls mm -hmm. of SEO, you know, that you identify yeah. in audits. Um, yeah, Kyle, uh, is there more or was that? Uh... <laughs> I mean, again, with the common pitfalls, I would say just making sure that you are a accommodating those core of vitals, page experience metrics, making sure the new website is responsive, does have a mobile friendly version and Google can understand that, making sure all your, you know, your metadata is in properly optimized, making sure those indexing signals, canonicals, hreflang are in place, 
you know, making sure you're not linking to the staging site still from the production site, making sure that you have analytics, GTM, whatever you're using in place so you can actually track these rankings. And then, you know, what I see a lot of people do is they will try to move to from like a website that heavily utilizes HTML to maybe something that uses heavy JavaScript framework. And so not accounting for the different ways that Google needs to render your content into that, that sort of situation. So if you're now going to a platform that relies a lot more on JavaScript, making sure that you're not doing things like using JavaScript for your links and making sure that you have some sort of rendering solution, whether it be dynamic rendering, a pre-render.io, so that Google can understand the content of these heavy JavaScript pages as quickly and fast as possible. All right, all right. The more important question was these all um, issues that we're talking about, can we see them in small to medium sized businesses or can we also expect these kind of issues to happen in enterprise level as well? You know what? I, I think they can happen all over the place. Um, small to medium sized businesses. Absolutely. If these are common pitfalls that you see in websites, despite the size of the website or the organization that owns them. So, yes, absolutely. You know, with small to medium sized businesses, I think. A lot of these issues can arise because maybe they don't have the, you know, employees that have the SEO knowledge to account for all this, or maybe they don't have the resources in play. Um, you know, for an enterprise perspective, they're so big, you're working with so many departments that maybe things are being overlooked or you're not getting the organizational buy-in. So at the end of the day, absolutely can impact small business, medium business, or enterprise uh, size businesses. So you have kind of provided a bit of um, solutions and insight into how to pretty much fix these problems. Do it, does the solution still apply to enterprise level as well, just at a larger scale or are there more complicated um, solutions to these problems? So I think it can get more complicated from an enterprise level just because the sheer volume that might be associated with them. So from like a, a website standpoint, the number of redirects that you have to account for you know, go ahead and doing this migration process for a one or 2000 page website, we still follow the same process for like a 60 or an 80,000 page website. It's just the amount of time and effort that needs to go into it. So again, I think with the enterprise websites, the sheer volume is a bigger challenge that you often don't get on the smaller, medium sized business side of things. So you're oftentimes having to account for a lot of traffic and you're oftentimes having to account for a lot of different pages. And so this was actually one of the earlier humbling moments I had in my, my career was working on a, a large website where I came to the realization that, hey, you can actually have a redirect file that's too big. And you're in a situation kind of in the 11th hour. Now you're having to go through and figure out which redirects aren't going to make the cut uh, because this file size exceeds you know, what we're actually able to utilize here, um, which you know, doesn't happen too often, but I've seen this happen from time to time. And so, you know, to account for this, what we'll do is try to increase efficiencies wherever possible. And so, for example, one might be, you know, working with developers to trying to find wildcard redirect solutions, redirect rules that you couldn't put into place that maybe will account for large chunks of redirects. So you don't have to have these one-to-one -one redirects mapped out in an HTA access, HTA access type file sort of thing. Um, it also makes the prioritization and understanding URLs, you know, it, it, I mean, essentially it makes it a lot harder to map all these things out because 80,000 redirects, if you're going to have someone go in finding location of this content and here it is now and manually do all that, it's going to take you forever. And so I think I touched on like even a way that we use Screaming Frog to kind of, you know, try to programmatically approach this sort of process where we're scraping certain elements of a website using Excel to an index match, whatever it might be to kind of match those up. So we can then knock out redirects, you know, a couple thousand, 10,000 at a time, instead of going ahead and kind of manually doing one-to-one, -one. you know, it's very important that you were looking for efficiencies without sacrificing quality when you're doing this redirect mapping, especially with those high priority redirects. Um, you know, from the client side, I think it can get a little difficult on the enterprise side of things because you are working with so many different teams and so many different people. And you need to make sure that you're getting the appropriate buy-in from the right people. You need to be integrating with all these different teams, which can be, you know, exceptionally, or not exceptionally, but it can be harder if you're an agency trying to, you know, work with all these, you know, client-specific resources. Um, you know, site launches can be hectic and sometimes you need to be your own champion because they can go ahead and, you know, 
again, it can get a little hectic at the end. Everyone's kind of focused on their own initiatives. And so if you're seeing something from an SEO perspective that is going to be a major problem, you need to be calling that out. Um, you know, just one of the things about SEO migration, I will say is sometimes as the SEO, you need to just kind of hang on for the ride. Um, timelines are often moving with web development projects. I believe SEO should be one of the final stages of this process. So when you're doing that pre-launch QA, you have a fairly established website. And as these timelines keep getting kicked out because you know new requests from the client, pushback, people aren't hitting their goals, oftentimes that, you know, that launch date doesn't get kicked out as much. And so SEO team typically has less time than is initially kind of planned for to do everything that we need to do. And so it's a lot of bobbing and weaving and trying to keep up with an ever-changing timeline, being flexible for the client um, so that you still deliver the value that you know is important um, in probably what is going to end up being a condensed timeline. Because as you know, you're know, you getting into the site launch and everyone's frankly getting everything ready, the executives are screaming from the top, hey, get this thing launched. SEO is not typically on people's radar, but after you launch that website two, three months, if that traffic isn't coming back, they'll quickly change their tune on that. So you need to make sure that you're being as flexible as possible and also being your own champion when you might otherwise be lost in a sea of all the shuffle that goes in with the website launch. One thing you had mentioned, I think a bit earlier, and then kind of tied it up with saying that you have to get in touch with your developers to you know, get the end process done. I think you had also mentioned getting in touch with the sales team as well to also um, get more insight into your uh, progress. But um, I think in the beginning, I'm not too sure if I heard it right. You did say don't get the SEO team involved or did you say get the SEO team involved? The SEO team better be involved. So right, I right, think right. I think what I said was when we were, and, and apologies if I misspoke to this, but when you asked about the common mistakes, my one okay. of my first common mistake was not involved in the SEO team. That is a major okay. mistake. SEO team should be absolutely involved throughout the process. Right. So SEO team sales and a bit of the development as well. So how can we, let's say, successfully integrate these departments with each other along with, you know, not having any um, barriers between them? That's a great question. And I think, you know, there's different ways that you can approach that question. Um, you know, as an agency, we do a lot of these website migrations where we all have to work in tandem. Um, I think one of the greater areas of opportunity for integration is when you're running ongoing campaigns and trying to drive additional growth. Um, so, you know, from a website migration standpoint, um, you know, you need to have consistent and open communication with all departments, understanding everybody's roles um, and how you're going to need to work with all these additional teams to make sure that you're achieving what you need. You know, again, going back to the paid search example, getting a list of all the URLs that they are driving paid search traffic to to make sure that they are accounted for from a redirect standpoint is kind of like a as kind of like a fail safe, but also giving that list of URLs to the paid search team so that they can update their campaigns and drive users to the website or their landing pages as effectively as possible. The website development team, you know, fortunately here at Marcel Digital, you know, I've been here for seven years and just driving our developers nuts. They're great. They're very, very talented. But at this point, they've gotten very, very good at understanding SEO best practices, where at this point, they'll get a new development client and they'll be like, hey, shouldn't the canonical tag work like this? And I'll be like, wow, that's amazing. Absolutely. So, you know, I think getting a little off track, um, making sure that clear and consistent communication is open, making sure that everyone is looped in on the plan. Because one of the things that you need to do to have a successful migration is to have a plan in place. So everyone knows exactly what they need to be doing and when. And so the development team should know that, hey, when we get you know this portion of the project, we need to loop in SEO to consult from an information architecture standpoint or you know how to content load this particular aspect. So you know I know this is kind of loose, but these are some of the ways that we can kind of integrate with each other um, in a website migration project types, uh, type standpoint. Now, when we're talking about you know, what we can be doing from like a services standpoint for in terms of driving growth, this is where we find our teams integrating probably the most at Marcel. Like we are constantly talking throughout these website migration projects, but we have found that we can drive much more successful campaigns when we're integrating our departments. And I think as a basic example, you know, the paid search department and the SEO department where we are regularly sharing keywords, you know, with SEO, I can't go in and see this term drove this many conversions last month, but you know who has that data? Paid search. 
And so we can go in and see these specific queries that are driving conversions. And maybe they're, they're terms that you never thought of. Maybe they didn't stick out to you because you plug them into SEMrush, the search traffic numbers just aren't that high. But in a paid search campaign, you get much more of the actual. So you see the traffic coming in, you see how it's engaging with your website. And if it's performing well, that's probably something that you should engage in and go after from an SEO perspective. Um, you know, I'm, I'm an advocate for, in terms of non-branded rankings, anytime you can secure more real estate at the top of a search result page for queries that drive that sort of transactional intent, you go for it. So aligning with paid search where you're showing them, hey, here's where we hold uh, strong positions organically and having the paid search, you know, start bidding on those as well, to take up additional real estate. Just another example of how we are communicating from a keyword perspective, sharing data and kind of pivoting our strategies to accommodate that. Um, another one that we commonly see, and this came out of a, a recent example for our clients from paid search is bidding on branded search. You know, if paid search is going to ramp up their branded campaign, they will come to us and communicate that because if you're going to ramp up paid branded paid search, you can expect that you're going to lose some of that traffic from organic that historically organic had picked up. So one of the things that we had done from our clients recently was reevaluated from an overall search perspective to see, okay, we know that they have some competitor uh, conquesting issues in paid search, but what we did is we got super granular to identify branded search queries where those competitions and no other ads are showing up, where it's just our client. And we also know we hold the number one ranking position. In these sorts of situations, we aren't incredibly scared of losing that traffic to somebody else bidding in paid search because at this point there's no one there and so we'll actually go ahead and pull back funds from a campaign or from a keyword like that and reallocate them to maybe some non-branded areas that we can test to see if we can get some additional traffic that's you know we're not getting right now whether we're testing keywords to determine if we want to optimize for seo or if we just want to go ahead and increase our non-branded share market share um, you know, I think this is a very real and recent example of how the two teams have worked together to make branded paid spend more efficient so we can reallocate those funds to different areas, knowing that we're going to pick those thing up, uh, pick those up on the SEO side. So this last kind of question might be a bit, it might be a big ask, but I, I hope you can power through and let's see if you can, though. Um, it's kind of like an example type situation, more of like a case study, let's say. Um, could you maybe explain the process of website migration while also keeping in mind how um, different departments have to also keep in touch with each other and have that integration involved? Um, briefly, because I see you've already pretty much explained the entire thing. So maybe just, <laughs> we just want like maybe like a summary of it all. I like, you know, when, I, when, when, my, uh, when my employees and coworkers hear this, they're going to love when you talk to them briefly because they know me for being very long winded. <laughs> um, but a lot of it comes back to the, the earlier process that we talked through, you know, with the analysis, the content analysis to redirect mapping. And so, you know, a couple areas, if you're going back and revisiting that where we're integrating is with the development team. And that's when we're consulting on the new website, right? To make sure that it is being launched as optimally for SEO, that information architecture, meta tagging, how to properly content load. So at the end, I'm not going through and being like, there's no H1s, you didn't do the correct hierarchy from a semantics HTML standpoint, whatever it might be. Um, again, making sure that you're very up to date with the development teams and the timelines that they're working with. When's launch going to be ready? When is the staging site going to be fully built out for us to go ahead and QA? Um, and for them doing the little things they need to do to go ahead and set up testing, whether it be um, you know, again, setting up a local site so you can redirect, test QA, all that sort of good stuff. You know, the paid search team for a website migration project, I think the big one is making sure that you are accounting for paid search URLs for this migration standpoint. Again, I believe paid search campaigns should be updating their landing page, the landing pages that are campaigns to reflect the new URL structure. But if not, those redirects are kind of that saving grace. That's the thing that's going to catch it if that landing page wasn't in fact updated. So making sure that even if they're driving it to pages that might be no indexed, that you are accounting for that from a redirect perspective. And then again, when things go live, you know, just making sure that they are all in the loop on that as well. And the analytics team is just, you know, I think at its core, just making sure that you have analytics in place. One of the things that we'll do is when we're crawling our client's website is we'll go ahead and make sure that GTM is present on every page. 
So at a very basic example, making sure that they have that implemented correctly and that all the goals that we want to track that maybe we were tracking before are being accounted for with the new website as well. So a couple brief examples, hopefully that hit what you were going for. Yeah, I think that was pretty much uh, on the marketer, just three minutes over one hour. I don't know if we have the time for this actually, but ChatGPT, now that you mentioned it, we were actually going to add that in our topic list. Um, but do, do you have the time? We could probably just ask one or two questions on that. Sure, go ahead. I'll do what I can. ChatGPT, <laughs> how do you feel it as a marketer's um, marketer's marketer, let's say, or a marketer's writer? How, how do you feel about ChatGPT and helping out marketing and SEO and the general sphere of content as well? So uh, ChatGPT, never heard of it. Um, just kidding. I, I think, you know, you go on LinkedIn and you see 50 different articles being posted of 100 different ways that you can use ChatGPT. Um, for my perspective, I think you can start using it for things like writing meta descriptions in terms of creation of content or potentially ad copy on the paid search side of things. I like to use it to get a couple different variations or thoughts around, you know, different topics that we could write about. Um, you know, it, it's really an effective tool for research and kind of putting potentially even putting together the framework of what you want a content resource to be. But it's important to understand the limitations of chat GPT, you know, what we see is, in the, especially a lot of the verticals we work in, whether it be healthcare or just digital in general, things evolve very quickly. And if you are now using a database that only goes up to what, September of 2021, you might be significantly missing the boat on important new statistics, you know, changes in your industry, changes in trends, whatever it might be. And so there is a potential pitfall of relying on it for that because maybe you're missing out on all the fresh new topics that are starting to get buzz. Because the sooner you get that content out there, the sooner you are one of those original sources to be ranking based on a specific query or topic, the better you're going to perform for that in the long term. So, you know, I think it's important to be mindful if you are going to use it for content creation, which I'm not ready to do that just yet. Um, you have to know that it's a it's a limited database. It's not completely up to date. You're not getting the latest and greatest from an information perspective um, in terms of content creation. I think if you are going to go the route of creating content that you're going to publish on your website with a chat GPT type resource, you better be reviewing that thing very closely, editing it heavily, um, running it potentially through like a copy scape plagiarism type checker, because you also don't know if somebody else is getting a very similar or the same output. Probably not. But with all the people using it today, you just don't know. And so, you know, at this point in time, you know, Marcel Digital has established that we are not ready to go ahead and just create articles and slap them up on our clients' websites for content creation purposes, but we are absolutely exploring and testing different ways that we can utilize ChatGPT with, you know, incorporating specific prompts and whatnot to go ahead and try to enhance our capabilities from a research or a content ideation type standpoint. It was interesting to hear everything you had to say. I, I like listening in anywhere. Uh, one other side part of it was that I kind of asked ChatGPT to make like a two line horror story and then asked it to kind of elaborate on that. So that's my kind of interest in like reading and just being like, what is possible? What can be done? So when I heard you just chatting in general about how much there is to know about website migration, integration and all of that, I was just like, I'm absorbing all of this. This is really great stuff. Like, perfect. Keep talking. Go ahead. Stan Ventures so is going to be worry. offering migration services after this. I like it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Who knows? Maybe we'll uh, tie you in with it to partner. Why not? <laughs> but anyway, it was lovely chatting. Um, I think this is like one of the funniest podcasts we have done. I haven't really kind of like smirked every now and then being like, wait a minute. I can't, I can't really laugh because if I have to unmute my mic and then the dog's barking, but I have to just keep calm and be like, cool, we'll just, we got this. It's funny, but like, let's do it. So thank you so much again. Like it was a good chat. You've kind of made it really comfortable and easy to talk to as well. Um, I hope we can you. have you again, maybe for another episode. Yeah, absolutely. Aaron, this was great. I, I really appreciate it. And I would love to do this again sometime. So keep, keep me on the deck. If you don't publish the podcast and lose 200 followers because of what I had to say, would love to go ahead and do it again. Had a lot of fun today. I appreciate you having me on. All right. All right. We'll keep that deal though, for sure. Thanks for watching that episode. I hope you enjoyed. For more videos like this, make sure you like and subscribe.